We don't know how to free Zelda, but we do know why kids love them and critics hate them. John Stossel reports, nuts for- Nintendo's been dominant ever since they entered the gaming industry, right? I mean, they've made their fair share of missteps, I know. Hey, excuse me, princess. But they always came out on top. Our video game industry is hotter than ever this season, and one good reason, Nintendo has introduced some hot new toys. What's going on, Pro Guys family? I'm Keith Allen, and today, we're gonna be looking at exactly why the Wii U failed, where the Wii succeeded. And it starts with Nintendo of America's president during the Wii era, Reggie fils a man. What? I mean, he was both incredibly popular with the fans and it helped revamp Nintendo's image after the GameCube. You know, skills he developed at his previous job as the director of marketing at Pizza Hut. Seriously, his plan for the Wii was to appeal to both hardcore gamers and more casual audiences instead of just pushing for more technological progress. Nintendo needed to be moving sideways. If what they were making was good, they knew the customers would come. A new definition of progress outside of graphics would be created. They were right. When the Wii first came out, everybody wanted one. It launched on November 19th, 2006, and would outsell the Xbox and PS3 for the whole of the next year. It had the best launch in Nintendo's history, and people were still begging for more. Nintendo was making around 1.8 million Wiis a month, and it was still selling out immediately worldwide. So by early 2010, it was the best-selling home console in Nintendo history. When they finally stopped production of the Wii, it had sold over 100 million units, far more than the Xbox 360 and PS3. From both the console's motion control to games like Mario Galaxy, Nintendo had earned their definition of progress. You would choose between buying an Xbox 360 or a PS3, but you knew you had to get the Wii. We would like to play. Nintendo started thinking about the follow-up to the Wii as early as 2008. Satoru Iwatu, the former director of Nintendo, wanted to create a console that was baked into the user's daily life. Shreds of this came through in the Wii with games like Wii Fit and Wii Sports. However, with the Wii, Nintendo had created the perfect console for the casual gamer, but slightly alienated their more hardcore fan base. They wanted something that would appeal to both. Their solution? Welcome to the world of Wii U. This is the new controller for Wii U. No console before or ever since has had anything similar to it. It was a blend of both traditional controller design as well as the new direction Nintendo had taken with the Wii. It had buttons, analog sticks, and a D-pad, but it also had a touchscreen and motion controls built into it. It was both a controller and a display. It changed how some games played entirely. You no longer needed to just pause Zelda to just swap out items to check the map. One swipe on the gamepad and it was done. Iwata's vision for the Wii U wasn't only as a game's console though, he saw it as a home entertainment unit. Sure, you use your PS3 to watch Blu-rays or DVDs, but it was still an addition to the room. Nintendo's philosophy with the Wii U was that it would control your living room experience. Everything that you would need to know about their approach is in the fact that the gamepad could both display games on its screen, but also work as a TV remote. It legitimately has a universal remote built into it. You could even use it to make video calls. Sure, I, I would love to make some comments. Nihon no Minisan, Kinichiwa, Nintendo, Obu America, no Reggie Des. Maybe you noticed a few things as they were chatting. First, we can all feel better about my job security after hearing Reggie's Japanese. Nintendo has a well-deserved reputation that they're stubborn and, you know, and they're stuck in the past when it comes to online gameplay, especially on the Switch. The dock doesn't have an Ethernet port and games required an app just to use voice chat. The Wii U had one big difference, though. It had Miiverse. Even today, like, there's nothing else like it. All modern consoles have some degree of just sharing screenshots and videos, but they only let you share to the other social medias. 
Meverse was its own social media. It was implemented in every game, giving really specific online experiences you couldn't get anywhere else. In the HD remake of The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, you could leave notes in a glass bottle, which other players could find when exploring the ocean. This is the same sort of online system that shook the world when Dark Souls popularized it, and Nintendo had taken it further. On top of that, Miiverse also functioned like a normal social media feed. It wasn't limited to just text either. I mean, you could use the touchscreen to share drawings. It was essentially PictoChat, but online. It was a way of connecting with other Wii users that made it feel like a genuine community. The Wii U seemed like the perfect follow-up to the Nintendo Wii. In Iwata's own words, it was both deeper and wider. The Wii U launched on November 18, 2012 for $300 and was the first next-gen video console. It was sold at a loss to get as many potential customers as possible. The all-new Wii U. How you will play next. This is a common tactic used by Xbox and Sony. They get you in their ecosystem, and they make their money off each game they sell. This was definitely new territory for Nintendo, though. Previously, I mean, they would make a profit of every system they sold, even as far back as the NES. The Wii U released an entire year before the PS4 and the Xbox One, and things were looking really good at first. It sold out almost instantly, moving over 400,000 units. That's 100,000 more that the Wii did at launch. By December, Nintendo had sold over 3 million Wii U's worldwide, but the Wii's dominance was because of its longevity. I mean, it kept selling those amounts every single week. Only two months later, in January 2013, there was a sharp drop. Only 57,000 Wii U's were purchased in the US. For comparison, this late in the Wii's life, Nintendo was selling over 400,000 consoles a month. Suddenly, Nintendo realized that making something good wasn't enough to bring in customers, especially if they don't even know your consoles exist. The Wii's branding was so successful that it ended up hurting the Wii U. The original Wii had Wii Motion Plus, Wii Play, Wii Party, and it goes on. Nintendo's new console just ended up sounding like another peripheral. They knew they desperately needed aggressive advertising, so they stuck to deeper and wider. Hey, my time's dropping fast, people. Boo! Time to upgrade to Wii U. But they cast the net so wide, it became unclear who the Wii U was even for. Was it a family console or was it for the hardcore? Like, sometimes it seems like Nintendo didn't even know. Be honest, like if you were going to make a console specifically aimed at hardcore gamers, would you design the adverts to look like this? Happy holiday games! It's Peyton, and the best part of the holidays for me is my family's annual tradition of playing video games. Yeah! This year, we're all playing as a team in Super Mario 3D World. Whoever comes in last place has to wear Dad's ugly holiday sweater for a whole day. Look at me climbing the wall! Oh, I'm climbing the Again. wall. Dad, give the double strike power up! Oh. Oh. Let's see who came in last place. Peyton! Oh. Ah! I want a rematch. So in order to keep the Wii U's version of being a home entertainment device, Nintendo decided it needed a weaker processor and a lower power consumption. This let the Wii U cool efficiently and make no noise. Luckily, it would make no noise for another reason as well. The weak processor meant nobody would even want to make the games for it. It struggled even to run PS3 and Xbox 360 titles despite being next-gen. Without any games, a console is just an overpick brick. The Wii U had no Killer Mario, Zelda, or Pokemon at launch to justify buying it. In fact, most of the launch titles were either games that had already been released such as Batman, Arkham City, or COD, Black Ops 2. If you wanted to play these, you probably already had. So on top of all of this, the games that were brand new mostly offered experiences similar to the Wii, such as New Super Mario Bros. You purchased this incredible gamepad, but hardly any game utilized that technology to its full potential. Developers were barely selling any games, and with the PS4 and the Xbox One out soon, the Wii U quickly became unattractive to many developers. In less than a year after launch, Big publishers like EA and Ubisoft announced that they were no longer making games for the Wii U. Some retailers even stopped selling the console less than a year after it came out. From April to June 2013, Nintendo sold over 160,000 Wii U's. That sounds pretty good, right? Or at least it would be if the original Wii didn't sell over 210,000 during the same period. Their own outdated hardware was outselling them. One big reason was the price. Nintendo spent the Wii generation building an image of being the cheaper additional console you buy. But at $300, it became really hard to justify, particularly when it was only 100 more for the more powerful PS4 or Xbox One. 
Nintendo realized their mistakes later and tried incredibly hard to correct them. They cut the price of the Wii U by $50 to try to regain their reputation as the cheaper device. Most of the best-selling games on the Wii would receive sequels too, like Mario Kart, Smash, and even Zelda. Nintendo was going all out for pushing new IPs too, like Splatoon and Mario Maker. They even tried to change their advertising image and started working with new production companies like Mega64. We can make a game that, so, you know, well, you could, you were, you said, no, uh, you were, you can make a game that, you could do anything. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Reggie! I realized something when I was training with all of those classic games. Nintendo's great. I really had the best job in the world. Tanner, I have to ask you something. Would you give me my old job back? But what will I do? Do you have any skills? It was just too late to play catch up though. These changes helped the console recover slightly, but it was still underperforming. Nintendo had begun work on their next console in 2012, but production was forced to be sped up after the Wii U. It was easily the worst kept secret in the gaming industry. Rumors had always circulated it was in development after the terrible Wii U launch, but its existence was actually confirmed on May 17, 2015, almost two years before the Switch even came out. This definitely put off the new Wii U buyers, but at this point, Nintendo was more concerned with simply moving on. They still supported the Wii U with new releases and updates, but it was clear it wasn't their new main concern. Nintendo looked at the Wii U critically and realized that they were actually fantastic potential at the heart of it. One of the most loved features by fans was the ability to play console games on the gamepad screen. Having remotely anything to do with the Wii U would have been a gamble, but they were betting on themselves. Did they really believe in their product? Their marketing for the Switch was stronger than ever. I mean, it was clear that they were returning to their roots. They had ditched the sterile white and blue of the Wii and revisited the eye-catching red and white of the Famicom era. Their average showed the Switch as an incredibly high-quality device, and they showed off its portability at every chance. Nintendo's launch titles were far more alluring too, like many people hadn't played The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, and it was essentially a brand new game. They promised ports of the other games locked on the Wii U, like Mario Kart 8, as well as new games like ARMS and Mario Odyssey coming soon. Nintendo knew it was the lack of third-party support that had buried the Wii U, and this time went out of their way to prevent this from happening again. They built personal relationships with developers, publishers, and even indie studios, and had over 300 games released for the Switch in its first year. They priced the console at $300 again, but this time was sold at a profit. They would be making money on every Switch sold. To say their gamble paid off, that's putting it lightly. Within a year, it had sold over 14 million Nintendo Switches. That's higher than the total amount of Wii sold worldwide. By June 2020, the Switch had sold for over 60 million units. The top six selling games on the Switch to date are all Nintendo developed games and each have over 15 million sales. No matter how you look at it, it's a success. Reggie fils said that the Wii U was a necessary step in order to get to Nintendo Switch. If you take one look at both side by side, the Switch is still clearly a perfected version of the Wii U, despite you know, working so hard to recover their image. Is Nintendo getting too confident again? The virtual console in the Wii U allows you to play games from every single generation before it, even handhelds like the DS and the Game Boy. Now, if you want to play the same version of Mario 64 again, it's locked behind a $60 collection. They introduced Paid Online, but it has less features than with the Wii U. So let me ask you this, where do you see Nintendo going next? Do you guys think, you know, the rumor Switch Pro will deal with these issues, or will it just make them worse? Let us know your thoughts below. And once again, guys, thanks so much for joining us. Pro Guys family, I'm Keith Allen, and I'll see you soon. Oh, <laughs>